What's good? Listen music now, man. Good name the artist. Late great. Oh, well, listen, them little train, a little July camp. You say you don't feel to dance, you're tired of jumping. Why are you lying? Tell me the truth Baby, what is wrong with you? You acting up like a fool yes. Come on, I know what you're going through Come on, we go in the back and fool around We gonna keep all the doors and knock until we done Darling, come on, we go in the back and fool around How I talk about Kiki Palmer long Episode 148 of the Corey Shepherd Podcast. Welcome back to everybody who's been listening. Welcome to all the new listeners. Thank you for tuning in. You know, they say Kiki Palmer leading people better. Listen, I never seen nothing like that yet, man. <laughs> this podcast is back and all first and news and things second. You know, this is always about lacquery, cankala, and couture and commerce, and we sprinkling all the seriousness. Some song too sweet to stop to, you know. Winston So So, in case you didn't know, right? Cause too much attention, you need a strong man. Girl, I'm in the mood for love and affection. What taking you so long? Party, party on. Well, if you thought last week was long with Kiki Palmer, this is a whole crime week, you know, because the main story in the, I ain't coming to talk about who firebomb, who hulk, and ten man firebomb a house, but one man get hold. That's not what I plan to talk about, but at least 
We see plenty work being done towards crime plans and making the place a better place. So we want to make an assessment of all the crime. I see it a vetted unit. I see now the police commissioner checking license and insurance and all these kinds of also licensing officers, but at least movements being made to make Trinidad and Tobago a better place. But I start off with something last week that I must continue this week because last week I pulled out a great, the great scrunto. And let me tell you something. It has certain people, they, they, they just can't be covered in one episode. So it's like this. They used to say, one day for police, one day for thief. But it's two days for Scranton. Let me go! be late august a matter of fact it used to be late down in the year then it reached all the way to august now it's june july is band launching and i'm gonna tell the jury out for me you know i ain't sure if i could take two days on the road again i see a story come out this week saying uh i believe it's school and them who's do soccer having a brunch on a carnival monday like from about 10 to one o'clock standing still I feel like I kind of like the idea, you know, because the lunch stop game to be my favorite part of playing mass. So if they could have just a permanent lunch stop for the whole day, I don't mind that too much, you know. I don't mind that at all. I remember going through the Savannah some years ago, playing mass with my boy Edmund and them. And he had a partner who they just set up a booth, like a, a little hospitality center. I don't know what, what to call that, a bar and a, and a food station. In the middle of the Savannah, I don't know how you're getting permission to do that, but in the middle of the Savannah, he set up a little tent and thing. Okay. And people... All right, Siri, nobody knows you nothing. Yeah. I almost find a way in the episode, boy. Yeah, so he set up a little hospitality booth so everybody who crossed any stage coming in line by here, you know what I mean? You have a little people to massage your foot. I kind of like that. Maybe that's the direction I had to go in to play mass these years. But anyway, let me, let me, let me jump into the, to the, to the, to the kutcho. Crime, 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 crime. Everybody have a plan to solve crime. Everybody want to slow down crime. Everybody concerned. I mean, the situation again, progressively worse if you ask me. There's no, no sort of indication that things on the up. If anything, you're seeing more and more stories about crime and a murder rate or murder toll again higher and higher by the day. And the brazen wanton way in which crime co- being committed continues to be an issue. So... The boss of crime, the woman who says she have this under control in about six weeks. She said she's six weeks and she's going to make it into the most peaceful place in the country. 
She stopped talking to the media. She stopped talking to the media. She said the media keeping her back. I ain't get she wrong. You know? Every time you ask me question, question, I said, man, listen, when I come to work, right, if I come here to record, me and nobody stand up over my shoulder telling me what to talk about and when to stop and don't think. I don't like that, you know. You know, let's see how that little producer here. <laughs> it's about a little fella, you get fired. Too much of telling me what to do and thing. I can't take that too much. Or if I edit in, I sit down editing. They say, how oh, you cut it so close? No, 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 no. Keep it pushing. So the woman don't want no scrutiny, but... With with her released, um, she she do a pre-recorded release statement. It, it didn't look great, given that you're not talking to media. I think it would have gone on fine if you was taking questions from the media and so on. But if you're doing that as a replacement for a media conference, that will never go down well. Especially when you get yourself an A plus recently, you know. But by Keishan Haynes in the Guardian, it says the TTPS has posted pictures of Commissioner Ulla Hayward Christopher joining officers on a series of exercises last night. The photos came after, or was after the commissioner was criticized by MP Mo- Rudal Munilal for hiding and releasing recordings from an undisclosed location. He was referring to a pre-recorded video, uh, video message sent to the media late Friday night. Munilal said when Gary Griffith was commissioner, he was often seen with his senior officers visibly patrolling hotspots. <laughs> the TTPS uh, post shows the top cop in one photo, checking the driver's documents. In the, the other news, show her interacting with officers and members of the public. Again, this is where Gary would have always score points. And whether he was doing a good job or not, his visibility made him uh, at least popular. But also the, the, the visibility might have given you, even if it's false, some sense of comfort. And he called, you know what I mean? He, he come out bad and he say, boy, you can't live here, all your roaches. Coincidentally, I see Gary walking through sea lots. With the NTC and the, what, what the name? NTA and you NC and PDP and the Joint Forces, the coalition that is not a coalition, right? As nobody announced any coalition, but everybody riding for one another, it seems. We're just walking around with them. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's a combined effort. Or I guess, as the campaign seems to be saying, anything to get rid of the PNM, right? But imagine after calling the people roach and saying you're going to ask them for the vote. But that's what Gary was good at. Gary was good at the bravado, the public face and saying how good he was at his job. We, we'll explore it because I have some things he coming up in this week. But I mean, how would you feel if you're in a regular road traffic or exercise, right? And the commissioner of police <laughs> asks if you're like, not insurance. That, that song a little intimidating to me, you know. That, that, that does song like the greatest idea ever. I also feel like if, um, from a PR standpoint, if you want to show boots on the ground, a regular road traffic thing is not what we're looking to you for. You know what I mean? We're looking to you for something where 10 people firebomb in a hot. We want to see you there by that place. I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever. Is is, is is optics. I'm starting to learn more and more that I know very little about security. <laughs> but the reality is that... I if we if if seeing you is beneficial to us, I'm not sure that this is the way we want to see it. But salute to you. You're working. Checking license and so on. Everybody know licensing officers, they're short staff, so it makes sense for you to dress up in camel to go and check um check little license and so on. But it, 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 while that is happening, the Prime Minister seems to um he have the answer to this thing. The coalition, people could say what they want. The man had the answer. The man figured out how to get this thing done, right? So the headline again by Kijan Haynes from The Guardian says, the PM is willing to pay for extra police officers for integrity. Or to pay extra for police officers of integrity. So man will make more money. More will be invested by the government to get police officers of integrity. Now, Kijan write this thing a kind of way, right? Almost has to say that. They have police, and they have police with integrity. That might be two separate things, right? Let me, let me, let me hear what you had to say. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley said he's willing to pay more to police officers to be a part of what he described as vetted units, reserved for officers of the highest integrity. Not integrity, the highest integrity. Prime Minister Rowley is holding nothing back, said this proposal. Prime Minister Rowley, holding nothing back, said this proposal is necessary because there are too many criminals in the police service. I was in a meeting of the, with the Minister of National Security. Do you have that? And our experts and the American experts, where the American government has undertaken. I was in a meeting with the Minister of National Security and our experts and the American experts, where the American government has undertaken, and we have agreed to accept it to create within our police service what we call vetted units. 
I don't know what that sentence means. Vetted units meaning groups of special police officers, men and women, who are vetted to ensure their integrity is intact. Uh, I'll spare you everything he said, right? The idea behind the vetted unit is that you had to go through some kind of what they call a lie detector test, right? Uh, I guess to see what um, what level of involvement you have in anything or what, what how honest you are about. Because if, if you're going to take a lie detector test or them polygraph test, Assuming they have to ask you direct questions, right? Like, did you take any bribes? Are you involved with anybody in the underworld? You know so-and-so. We, we, or, or if they have accusations or, or anything that hanging over you, you could ask them that directly and see how they respond to that, right? My question to those polygraph tests is usually this. If you have people who apply, let me say our average, how much our police make? Let me say a, a police officer, an entry-level police officer is make about 10 grand, right? 15 grand, whatever it might be. And then I say, listen, I'm going to pay you 40000 to be a police officer in this vetted unit. Because it's it, it critical now, right? This is something that we need. Regardless of what you think about it, we need police who we sure not being, uh, uh, like their head not being turned by the underworld. They're willing to go against it. They're willing to take the fight to the criminals. Because we reach a point now where the criminals running free. And it looked like the police running and hiding. So you need a special unit of people who have special training and so on, but a high level of integrity. So let me say I pay each one of them 40. It stands to reason that if I'm making 15 and I feel my integrity good, or I could get away with proving, or I could I could figure out ways to show that my integrity good, even if it's not, that 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 should be an incentive or enough incentive to get people to come out and say, yeah, let me apply, let me throw my hat in the ring, right? I want to know after you take the lie detector test, when I ask you here now, you take bribe from so-and-so, and you say no, right? Because now you have to say no, you're looking for the work. I want to know what has happened to that person. <laughs> when the people who get vetted didn't pass the vetting, is they getting wetted? I, I want to understand. The only can't tell me that you need 30 people in a vetted unit. And 30 people apply. It had to be It had to be plenty of people apply, right? There's more money demand, say plenty of people going to apply. The ones who the polygraph started to dance, it started to dance when they ask you about your bribery and your underworld involvement and your you, you, you planting this on people and manipulating uh, cases and so on before the court. They had to be asking them direct questions, right? When you say, no, I am integritous, and that thing started to dance, is it, is it that you're getting locked up immediately? Are we looking for evidence on you? Are you asked to resign from the police force? Because it can't be that... The vetted unit is created for a high level of integrity and honesty. We find people who don't have that and maybe shown as involved. The technology is showing them to be involved in nefarious activities. And then they say, all right, go back to being a constable. You can't get any vetted unit. But you still run. You, you go ahead and run. You go on a station. You're good to go. Sorry about that. You can't get here. But go ahead and continue and collect your little 10 and your 15 and so on. And make a wrongs when you figure out how to lie better. Is that the case? I want to understand. Another layer of the vetting of police officers is their financial uh, records. From, from my understanding, a part of being on a vetted unit is that we must get access to your historical financial information and be able to see what your transactions like. I want to see if you have... And this is, I mean, we, we could talk openly here. We could talk, we, we, we could talk in big. When you look at some police officers' salary and their lifestyle, something not right. We could all see, we could eyeball it, right? We could eyeball it. Now, I'm not saying that a police officer can buy an a, a apartment building two up, two down. He can have a little side of sleep, have a business. But sometimes when you're watching these police officers and the, 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 their lifestyle, the amount of cars they have on the road, <laughs> some of them are big, big rental operation. <laughs> There are several car working. There are maxis on the road. They, they, you know what I mean? They, 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 they're well invested. They're well appointed. Let me not talk about Trinidad, right? I remember in Jamaica, they had a police officer they used to call Trinity, right? When you're passing through, I believe you know many places in Ligony, a place in Kingston. When you're passing through there and you see Trinity House, <laughs> Trinity House is like about 25 different houses they put together. Like wherever he's seen a magazine and a house looking nice, he's just put that on his existing house. It's about three levels. It costs scale as hell. And sometimes you see some of that with our police here. It's like, okay, if you if you can, and I'm not saying that a policeman must not be independently wealthy. I'm just saying they must pass this scrutiny so that when I ask you for your books, I ask you for your financial records as a police officer. 
I must be able to say, all right, your mortgage, your house is $5 million. You pay for this house cash. Let me see how much of them maxi and them rental and all them kind of thing. How much of that you rent out? How much, how much, how much money you make? Every business should be able to show this. It's our, it's our whole procurement thing going on now so that businesses, everybody know who's director away and who collecting what shareholding, which part, and how much our business make, how much you're supposed to pay the government. These are things that normal. Forget the average citizen. Even if you're all a criminal, a criminal must be able to show to the state or to the police how you came across your money. You can't tell me you're a fisherman. <laughs> you're a fisherman, right? <laughs> and your gold chain down to the ground. When you're driving, you're dropped up BMW, your gold chain blowing in the breeze, you're dragging on a chain on the ground behind you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And, and, and okay, fine. If you're a fisherman and you're doing that well, let me see. You must be owner in for a seafood company. I, I just want to see how much of fish you're bringing in, how much you're selling the fish for, how much you're paying your staff, and how much you have as profit. Because anybody who ever, anybody who ever buys something and sell it know how hard it is to make money in a business. So as a criminal or as an accused criminal or alleged criminal, one of the key things should be that you prove to me how you make any money. We see it with Escobar. We see it with um, who's the one the whole and tax evasion thing in, in Untouchables movie again? Al Capone. You see it many many times where the financial trail is what used to bring down criminals. So it can be that we have a vetted unit. We check in your financials, <laughs> and out of the sixty people who apply, only fifteen people financials pass the scrutiny. Then what is the plan for the next forty five? What are you doing about the next forty five? Who you see? Making fifteen thousand dollars a month, but spending eighty something thousand dollars a month. What is the plan for them? Is it that they then just get to go back and say, "All right, let me go back to my little constable walker." You know what I mean? <laughs> or if I if I find out you you know you living within your means, but that's heavy 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 accounts in your mother name and heavy million dollar can five hundred thousand dollar. I just want to know why. And that idea of a vetted unit. I mean, it is not. I, have no, I saw Rhoda Barrett talking about it, and it's not new to Trinidad, it's not new to the world either. It's, it's done all over the place. And, it, well, the, the article seems to suggest, or a subsequent article uh, from, well, Kijan Haynes again, said the FBI suggested the specially vetted unit to the government. So the article said, Prime Minister Keith Rowley says the U.S. agency that suggested the specially vetted unit within the TTPS is the FBI. Uh... When the Prime Minister announced Saturday in San Fernando that it was the United States who suggested the idea of a vetted unit, he did not give details about a specific agency. Uh, the, the U.S. in wanting to share information with us, because it is a lot, it is all about information, one of the conditions is that they must have confidence in the people with whom they associate. So it's a, it's a, there's an information sharing this, uh, situation between the FBI and, the, and our police. But they want, they want a vetted unit to deal with. Now, why wouldn't you do this without the FBI's involvement? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, Rolly said vetted units are not, are not new to the country given this, this banded SORT, S-A-U-T-T, a special anti-crime unit of Trinidad and Tobago, implemented by the Patrick Manning-led administration as an example. A more recent example was the Transnational Organized Crime Unit in the TTPS. He said that the unit currently requires officers to be vetted. So, in other words, you already have a vetted unit there. But the FBI asking you for a new vetted unit. I also remember that Gary, one of the first things that Gary did when he came in was said that um, any of the police who work with him had to have a lie detector test on these types of things. And I mean, beyond the question of those who fail to get into the vetted unit and what is done about them when they prove to either be lying about different things or have financial trails that they can't pass scrutiny or whatever the other the other things are. If they can't pass it, what happens to them? I also wonder about the motives of people. Let me give you a scenario, right? If I go in a bank, I'm looking for a bank work, and my goal, I want to go in as a bank manager, my goal is to see how I could figure out how to get a little hundred grand for myself every month. I will, I'll quickly realize that that's probably impossible to do on my own, right? So if I have to have people with me on this scheme, well, first, I want 100, so I'm going to up the thing to 300, we had a siphon off. I go get my 100, and I have 200 now as a budget to pay other people to be a part of my little ring, right? 
If I go in there and I have to look for people to work with me, one of the first things I will try to identify is who is the people who for sale? Who is the people who corrupt? Who is the people? We, we see enough movies, right? You watch CSI, you watch enough crime movies, you watch enough Law and Order, you watch all these things. So if I go in the bank with that intention, then I go and find other criminals in the bank who could pull this thing together with me. So if I have a lie detector test, what I ask in here about is not to do with bribes you would have received, or money that you... I don't care about that. I really ask in here about thing where if the pressure come on, will you go and rat? Will you go and inform? Will you turn state witness? That is the kind of question I ask in you. I ask in you, what is your willingness to bend the rules and be flexible? So if it is you have somebody who... And I know accusing neither Gary Griffith nor Rowley or anybody of being uh, criminal-minded. I'm just saying that the idea of a vetted unit really depends on what is the intention behind vetting the people. If I vet any people to make sure, as David Rudder say, that somebody go continue to let the cocaine pass, then it's a different kind of vetting I do it know because we're not going to ever be able to see neither the questions nor responses to any polygraph test that's going on within the police service in any special unit or special branch. I'm sure that the people who guard any prime minister or the prime minister bodyguard, he probably had to go through something like this too. But the man who guard any prime minister, a, a prime minister who have intentions of turning public funds into private um, private wealth, right? Private and l generational wealth. When he have a bodyguard who's going to hear all he moves and what he's going to do, his questions to vet that bodyguard going to be whether you're going to sell me out or not, whether you're going to play the game or close one eye or any discussion you hear here will not leave this room, right? So that's, that's where we are with this. The vetted unit seem to be happening, the FBI behind it. Uh, from my little bit of knowledge or history of the FBI and any U.S., U.S. in particular, those agencies, they tend not to be just magnanimous and just trying to help a small island. It, it, a lot of times their involvement comes from the fact that whatever is happening here affects the U.S. or they want to affect what's happening here to the benefit of the U.S. That is typically the way U.S. law enforcement, the army, that's how them is work. So it's either the men find something coming through here that's affecting them over there. Like, when you're watching Narcos, it's always amazed me how the U.S. was able to convince the DEA, who was working in Colombia and Mexico and stuff. It was amazing that they were able to indoctrinate these guys into believing that this is a, a supply problem. <laughs> they never seem to want to look at it as a demand issue. You have a country that, for some reason, have the highest set of drug takers in the world. You wouldn't check your own self and say, well, boy, maybe the stress levels in this country too high. <laughs> maybe the laws in this country need to change about what recreational and what is against the law. and what. Maybe we need to address that. Nah, they want to fight the fight on somebody else's soil. Always the case with them, right? So for them to be coming here trying to help Rowley, I, I do believe that there is some kind of, oh, you all having such a trouble. Oh, laws, let me send somebody to help. Look at my countries in the world having trouble with crime. <laughs> so if them sending somebody here is idle, they're protecting their own interests about the crime here affecting what happened in the States. Uh, they're keeping an eye on their partners in Venezuela, so they want to be here to make sure that nothing, we don't help them grow in any way. So there's a, there's a kind of backside of the coin that they're working on. Or they want to find out about somebody who's who here. <laughs> so when they say they want a vetted unit for we to deal with alone, they want to find out about somebody who down here who might be affecting their own interests. Did I have something to talk about with Jack Warner here? No, anyway. No, let, me, let me go in order. Let me go in order. I don't want to, um, <laughs> I don't want to jump all over the place. I want to, I want to also... Uh, let, me, let me get to Gary. At a public meeting, uh, Rowley said he's going to a vetted unit. In response, Griffith said... This is Gary Griffith responding to this vetted unit thing. He said, while he led the police service from 2018 to 2021, he implemented measures to weed out corrupt police officers. He added... We had added... We had the special branch, we had the SIU, we had the White Collar Crime Unit, we had SORT, SORC this time. These people are all vetted, polygraph tested, then we monitored their finances to make sure that they are not on the take. That is what I had, it was there before. But I think he kind of said it was there before, you know what I mean? At the Gary, and you know, politicians are funny set of people, you know. When Gary came in and put these units in place, he talked like he invent vetted units in it. 
So I guess a politician will always try to present something regardless of when it, if it happened before or not. They are to present things because a big part of their job. They may not try and look good. They're trying to make sure that whatever it is, they could score some political points or get mileage off of the issue. So Gary wasn't too pleased that, I mean, maybe just, or not, not, not so much not too pleased, but he's just pointing out that, Hey, all this was here before, and this was this was the situation. So, salute to you, Gary. Keep working with you, and see, you know what I mean? You're doing a good job, Oli. Oli, very, Oli, very visible in these campaigning streets. Some more efforts beside um beside walking and checking license and insurance. The Attorney General, funny enough, so uh, uh, we have a crime in this episode so far. We have a crime initiative from the PM. I hope it work. I hope the vetted units come out, the FBI and saying it, it work, and we, we, we start to see a calming down of this kind of wild violence and, 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 and stupidity that you see in the streets now, and reprisal and revenge. And who is, I, I hope that that starts to affect that. I also hope that Ola checking license and insurance start to curb that too. Uh, but as the Prime Minister, that is the Police Commission, I would think that they involved. But I find that it, it's... We're fit. Anybody wake up fit? Anybody tell Fitz crime is a problem? Find like everybody else talking about crime. Hey, and from Fitz at all. Must, they, 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 you get a gag out of it. I want to hear from the newest attorney general, Mr. Reggie Amor, because he had some uh, some initiatives too that a little more tech savvy. You know what I mean? He went down the road. And in, in this day and age, I feel if you're not trying to identify and use technology like while we might be developing or third world or whatever you want to call us, our crime-fighting initiatives have to be first world. Because when you look at the kind of high-powered weaponry that people are using, it's, it's, it's clear that the, the, the bandits, as we like to say, they're advancing themselves and making sure that they're well secure and they're using crime. I've heard stories about um, places like Mova and Lavanti and so on setting up camera systems. <laughs> So that they identify when police coming up the hill or when the ops coming up the hill fast. <laughs> so while I have my little one ring camera, I trying to make sure my little play. Them fellas apparently, I allegedly have a whole ring network set up. So them getting alerts on their phone. They say, oh, look, Alexander, and them coming right. Or they stash that. So if the if the criminal elements, and it is in their best interest to do that because that is a very lucrative business. We mustn't forget that. Crime is money. Men making loud money. Money that most people will never see in their lifestyle, lifetimes. Is all men, men, men involved in crime to make. So if it is that they stepping up their game using the technology, advancing themselves, I find like we must do the same. So Reggie, I'm all basically talking about things like artificial intelligence, uh, unmanned drones that are basically... So, so high-powered weapons... Uh, manage high-powered drone weapons. I could put it like that. So you, you pop a drone in the sky and them drone and them could shoot people. They're using cameras to monitor what's going on and then they're going shot when they see the situation. So I want to commend them for at least looking into the technology to see if that is one way that we had to try and stay ahead of the criminal element. Let me, let me hear from you there, Reggie. The present is the future. What we are talking about here today in terms of lethal autonomous weapons, artificial intelligence, we have to recognize that we can't react to these things because in the reactive mode, we are not going to catch up. We have to take in front. So the reason why this conference is very important is to recognize Mm -hmm. that this is a clear and present danger that we have to begin to recognize and provide legislation and regulations for so that if and when we have to deal with a problem that emerges, right. we are prepared for it. And what we're doing by this conversation here today is to educate ourselves to understand how best to deal with the present, which is the future. You have a piece of equipment out there in the sky coming at you. There's no man in a turret right. managing it. Um, right. But, you know, they can be weapons and lethal weapons. Right. And when they are managed by algorithms, they're not going to, as they uh, target you and they see a child running across, there's no capacity, a human capacity to stop. You know, so autonomous weapons that are geared to kill without human intervention right. have to be very seriously recognized as something that we need to do. Anybody can help me decipher what Reginald Amo was talking about. So it's autonomous, it's autonomous weapons, right? I wonder if you know what autonomous mean. <laughs> the man say the present, which is the future. All right, Reggie, I'm glad you're looking into this, and I'm glad that this is an option. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> I thought I thought I thought it was very advanced, but he sung like if um you know what he sung like like somebody now show him a PowerPoint about this and he take the main talking point and just say autonomous weapons future present autonomous algorithm shoot little children. He just he just <laughs> he doesn't take the only people talking points. <laughs> But again, this is something that I hope they continue to look into because, I mean, I, you don't necessarily want, like, the, the idea or the discussion around both autonomous uh, weaponry and robotics and so on and drones, that that, that that happened all the time, right? And we understand the fears with some of those things because when them things malfunction and kill somebody by mistake or whatever, I mean, them chances are unlikely. But even in the very, very small chance that it could happen, it's going to be a major problem if it does happen. And it could... It could I, actually hamper justice more than it, it helps but at least we must look into these things to try to find what is the best way for for for, for us to implement them as i say they, they say one day for police one day for thief right but police will also tell you that the thief had to, he, the thief had to get away a hundred times and the police had to only had to get through once you never catch you one time so if we could figure out the technology or anything that could help us understand the situation better and approach it differently it will always be positive to me. And in the meantime, somebody wake up fits now. But again, I am always here to play music. Everything else is incidental. So as I say, with the, with the great scrunter, he's a hard man to pin down one or two or three songs. When I, when I, play, a song, if I play five songs in an episode, it's plenty. But these fellas and them have catalog to burn. They have song to give away. And this one is one that might be for some of the more mature and wise audience, they're gonna know this one for sure. But some of the youths in the audience might know this too good. Only remember this. <laughs> Imagine all them animals See them play man Accompanied by Trapo and drag People leave the pavement And jump as they go Saying they never know Trapo could have play me before Oh na na tiri, oh na na tiri, oh na na tiri ko And the old man is crying
great sponsor. It's like dirt. Hey! Talking about the police and them police like they pull up by Farley, boy. All they do, Farley. <laughs> so they say yesterday morning, police police went to Farley's residence, right? So the headline is Police Search Farley's Home. Probe into THA audio leak. Now, I want all you to remember for me. This is episode, what, 148 or something like that? 147? Well, you remind me which episode we stopped talking about Farley now. We talked about Farley for about three weeks straight. We play audio clip of what they say was he and he say wasn't he. We play his response and why he say, you know what I mean? But the police like the Norwich because the ferry to Tobago really slow, you know, and sometimes that ferry is taking time. So, like, the police now reach over and they go on and check Farley. So, the article says members of the police's white collar crime unit. This is a vetted unit too. <laughs> white collar crime unit visited the residence of the Tobago House of Assembly Chief Secretary Farley Augustine in Lowlands, Tobago and searched the premises for several hours yesterday. The search was in relation to the audio recording of THA officials allegedly conspiring to use public funds for propaganda purposes. <laughs> During the exercise, items from the home were taken into police custody. One of the officers was observed re-entering the home with a number of brown evidence bags, so they're fine thing. They're fine things. The operation started around 11 30 uh, and the officers left Augustine's home three and a half hours later with bulging and en- brown envelopes. Bulging brown envelopes. A lot of things. Maybe I was making joke <laughs> and saying why they keep saying the tape and the tape and the tape, but maybe it's really cassette. Maybe it's really cassette. Them fellas had rest down making these recordings, but you never know, you know. If, if Reggie are more could talk about drones like this. Augustine had an attorney pres- present while, he, while being interviewed by officers. Acting Commissioner of Police Intelligence, Kurt Simon, was contacted for comments on the home being searched on the island. He said, I know in the investigative plan there was a plan to interview a number of, of persons involved in that who we suspect are involved in the release of that video. <laughs> I'm confused. The Express understands that the more war- more warrants were issued yesterday for homes to be searched in Tobago. DCP Simon said investigations are continuing into the matter. Quoted as saying, during an investigation, you'll realize that persons may or may not be interviewed depending on the police approach. Officers have in fact interviewed various persons in Tobago. Members of the Anti-Corruption Bureau and White Collar Crime Unit are in Tobago to continue investigate to continue to investigate the controversial audio re- recording released on May 23rd involved in, involving the THA officials. Okay, so here what? <laughs> I want to go back to that statement here. Simon, Kurt Simon is the Deputy Commissioner of Police Intelligence Unit, it looks like, right? He's quoted as saying, I know the investigative plan. I know in the investigative plan there was a plan to interview a number of persons involved in that who we suspect are involved in the release of that video. I'm trying to figure out what it is they're investigating here. Is the release of the video the crime? Or are they investigating the fact that it was said that we will use THA funds for for people to spread propaganda about what would be the PDP at that time, but now is the Fali DP, right? What, what, what is the situation? What, what it is we really investigating here? And I mean, three and a half hours to search a man's place. What coming out of them bulge envelopes? But... The search was done. This is very, very fresh. This just uh, came out in the Express this morning, so I just want to highlight it. Again, Farley will probably be back in next week because he's going to respond to this, especially when you're a politician and local government election going on and them kind of thing. Not that it's affecting them directly, but you, 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 you're going to have to save face. You're going to have to respond. You're probably going to hear from the Watson Dukes of this world and the other um, UNC Alliance collaborators, whatever it might be. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this. The PNMites going to talk about this too because them don't seem to be too happy with Farley. <laughs> but it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds because I, I, I don't want to say like the white collar crime unit. Like I, I read articles every week to come here and talk about stuff, right? And I have not seen the white collar crime unit mentioned much. I have certainly never spoken about them in the history of this. This is the first time I ever talk about anything that they investigated. I'm not saying they don't do nothing. It must be me who missing it. All you know, I, I kind of blind in what I don't see too well. And sometimes I doesn't understand what I'm reading very well and them things. But I never talk about these people before. And I do in this for a living. I do in this every week, right? <laughs> I listen to several other local podcasts who cover news and cover stories and so on. As I talk about that, two salute to the people who doing die good talk 
uh, podcast. Check them out, youths. I, I, I like their vibes. It's, it's, it's looking new and looking fresh and looking expensive. You know what I mean? Die, die good talk. D A I good talk, right? Salute to them. But in listening to the lo- the podcast landscape, the radio landscape, you, you hardly hear the white collar crime unit going and investigate or, or a big public figure. And a big part of the discussion around crime is that who benefits? Where does the money end up? It's not enough by poor people, right? Obviously. But it seems as though they're busy here. They take the time and reach Tobago and they're checking out this situation and stuff. And I'm not saying that this is not deserving of their time. I just find it interesting that this is one of the biggest moves. I, I worry here. Like, you all feel there's a real big separation between the police and the state and the judiciary. And I, I, I honestly feel like if you're in control of the the political side of it, in terms of the government itself, like the legislature, if you're in charge of the parliament, I feel like you're in charge of the whole country here. I don't think we have much separation between these things. In other words, I'm saying that if tomorrow all you elect me as prime minister, I shall send people to investigate all you. I, I, I send in people. I, I, I take a note. All the people who do bad things to me, all the people who say nasty things to me, all the people who treat me bad. I have, I've only, I used to say in my back pocket, I've only right on my back pocket. And as soon as I win the election, <laughs> I'm going to say, go and investigate this one. Go and investigate it. You know what I mean? I said, any white color, black color, every color crime is have unit. I said, in them by you to investigate things. And sometimes I wonder if that is not the case in this country. And again, I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that this is not worthy of investigating. I just find it strange that this is only the biggest story. Well, all right, Farley, Farley getting investigated, right? So we will continue to to keep our eye on that. Um, do I have any other serious thing? Let me get all the serious thing out of the way, you know, before I get back to what this thing is really about. Jack one, right? So let, me do, let me talk about Jack one and put this to bed. I am very confused. As much as I see the the coming together of the different parties, right? Uh, UNC and NTA and seem as though PDP involved in that. So it's have a little squad coming together, right? Uh, knowing that I was thinking about the ILP. You don't remember how some of the COP reports I released last week saying they're not contesting the election? It's like, who asked you? Who asked you to contest and who asked you to tell me you're not contesting? But headline from the Express series by Anna Ramdas, Jack Warner says people need to come out and vote. It's beautiful. Former government minister Jack Warner has urged citizens to come out and vote in the August 14 government polls if they are fed up with Prime Minister Keith Rowley and he wants to see a positive change in this country. Speaking to the Express by phone yesterday, Warner, the founder of the ILP, said he will be campaigning in the background in full support of the united effort of the UNC and the NTA. Anything that will help bring political change in this country is welcome. And if Gary Griffith and Kamala are together politically, then I think this can only augur well for the future. One who is active in the East West Corridor, active. <laughs> One who is active in the East West Corridor and hails from Aruka said there's a groundswell of disenchantment over the poor governance. You can see people are unhappy in this country. Everywhere you go, people don't smile anymore. People are very disappointed. But at the end of the day, it's up to the people to make the change they want to see in the country. I wonder if the white collar crime unit know that Jack Warner is in the East West Corridor and he hails from Aruka. I wonder if anybody ever tell the white collar white collar people this. Warner, a former UNC chairman and co leader, said he has spent years in service to Trinidad and Tobago and he will never turn his back on his country. I, 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 I believe that. He noted that the local government polls do not attract widespread attention as a general election poll and the voter, voter turnout is typically low. However, he said. This year, a resounding message must be sent to the Rowley government, especially when it comes to speaking out against issues like crime and unemployment. Jack, know the FBI here? Why is he making statements? <laughs> Jack, stop reading the sunshine. Read the other papers and listen to the radio and things. Stop reading sunshine alone. The FBI is here making deals with people. You need to keep quiet. You point out things. Say, well, but you, anyway, let me come off for you. Eh? Only Jack say go out and vote, so go out and vote on them kind of thing. Jack wants to see the back of Rowley. Maybe he wants to see himself back in power. Maybe that's the only hope to try to, to try to avoid to try to avoid the FBI and make sure that he stays somewhat in the clear at some point. Anyway, back to Scranton, you know, because it's a good bit to play. I have, a, I have a few more things to talk about with the sports and them things concern, but I want to make sure that we do the great Scranton some justice. I wonder if only a song in only mind by now that Scranton would have done. 
When last you hear this one?
Arranged by Teddy Coach. Let me tell you something. That little solo you're hearing on that keyboard, you don't play that solo. <laughs> Great Pelham got up. It's always have a piece of St. James and everything you had to do in it. Always have a piece of St. James. I want to tell you a story about that song before we go back to what it is we come to talk about, right? The woman on the bass is a real woman by the name of Annie Lopez. Salute to Annie Lopez, right? So if you didn't know, this, this song... You know, sometimes you're watching something on Netflix and in the end they say based on a true story and you can't believe it real. Well, this song is entirely based on a true story. So the idea behind the woman on the bass, if you listen to the song good, right? I know we listen to it, especially the pan version, right? Plenty of history to it. The idea was that I believe it would have been 79 where they had a boycott of the um, a panorama, the band's boycott panorama. So what's Scrantor singing about when they... Uh, all the while I hear it was only brass and DJ. Pa. He's talking about people coming in the country to go panorama to hear pan. But you only hear combo bands and, 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 and the DJ playing or brass bands and the DJ playing, right? Because the pans boycott. But Despas went ahead and play. And the song they play was Symphony in G, arranged by Clive Bradley. Make the spectators leave the stand and just jump up on the band. On the stage where people went rampage. So he's singing basically about the real story that happened in Savannah when Despers decided they was going ahead and play. Well, all the other bands stay away. So people people get more excited. Or people went in rampage according to Scranton. Really because it's the only opportunity they get to hear Pan for the day. And Annie Lopez was the woman on the bass. She was playing bass for Despers. So let me read the article, right? This is by Dalton Narine. Now this... Adults on the Rhine right in that kind of way, right? Everything philosophical and things. So bear with me, but I'll break it down, right? He says, very Trinidadian. This cross-cultural love affair that hasn't lost its passion in 32 years. Maybe it has exceeded the threshold of the romantic ideal. Though, like any other relationship with its libido, <laughs> every once in a while it arouses complications that chafe the heart in life and in death in a way. Says the principal protagonist in this bluesy soap opera, the woman on the bass, Tong say, lives incognito, but many regard as a dream and a vision. In 1979, Symphony in G, arranged by Clive Bradley. The year you waltz into the lyrics, into Despers Panyard, cold with a John Wayne-like swag, complete anonymity disguised in true grit. You remember? It was a famous season of the pan boycott at Panorama and a fat Tuesday too. Who would believe that a few years earlier, a few of your colleagues in Sforzato would treat you like, like a drive? <coughs> Shucks. When they turned out for practice, they would mumble, uh, trouble come. So apparently the backstory is that she was with Sforzato before, playing six bass, which is not no easy thing to play, right? And she eventually went over to Despers. They say, you a bass player? Not if we can help it. Tough to make the panorama side if the bass lines are dribbled out to you as though from the nipple of a baby bottle. How do you channel such embarrassment? It drove you to the steep incline of the Despers Panyard. Smack into manager Rudolph Charles. Only remember Rudolph Charles. If you, if you are listening to this, you must know who's Rudolph Charles by now, right? Up, up to last week, I play Scrunter, uh, Golden Tenor, singing about Rudolph Charles. Rudolph Charles is the man with the hammer, right? Uh, Kim Johnson, author of the illustrated story of Pan, Noted that a stranger back then could just go up love until to hang out. Maybe not so much anymore. And now we are now we are Despers woman on the bass, the only one. So she make it in Despers now, right? The only player for whom Charles fashioned the soaker six because he found you uncomfortable behind the flat six. So he changed up the pan for her. Just to make her make it easy because again he wants her playing in the band, right? So you the stone that the builder refused by Sforzato. So matter fix, now look at you. Booming out Bradley's lines in a three drums, three up, dunk, three up, dunk, three up, three down set. Cello had leavened the instrument with its own distinctive range too. Between cello and tenor bass is how you would recall its specialty. Although a fellow named Root stood beside you through thick and thin, teaching you the pan, remember how bassmen give you a cut eye? None of them thought you had an inkling of how you brought up. She had endowed you with the guts on or the Bull and the charm of this Dalton. Why is Dalton making this so difficult for me to read? <laughs> that you had been dancing since you were nine. That you mash up 1969 Best Village by snaking under a bar of balanced on a pair of Coke bottles. Then coming up for air and the trophy of the best female limbo dancer. 
At 18 years old, still brittle like a butterfly, you couldn't have imagined how penthouse tourists would, were freaked out by your nightly dance on broken bottles. Then your dream about performing with Trinidad Dance Theatre and Hummingbird Dance Theatre came true, and gigs began to multiply, notwithstanding signs of the vision at home. Uh, signs of the vision at home, I could skip past some of this. If you've never met her, you wouldn't be able to guess what she's done in her life. In a, deep, in a deeper sense, not even your despot's husband of nine years, jealous and overbearing. He wasn't cool about your stint at Sfazate in the first place. Why then would he have expected to, for you to stand out for this behavior in, in Despot? So when you look at the backstory, this is Annie Lopez is a woman of the culture coming through several different aspects of the culture. Land in Despot. Adjustments had to be made for you to be the base woman in, in Despot. But the, the great Rudolf Charles, the man with the hammer, he like you. With those adjustments, you take that and make it your own. 79, nobody show up. But you do. And you become a spectacle. You become the thing to look at. Because anybody who ever, anybody who love Pan, Pan is not just something to listen to. Pan is something to watch. And one of the things you particularly like watching is the bass men or the bass women when you see them. Because it, it have a kind of movement to the bass and a, a kind of action film part of it. That you cannot see. You can't, you cannot look at it as a spectacle to behold. And in that year where people celebrate Despots for playing that, Scrunter, the great Owen Rez, come and see that. And make a song about you. So much you do in the culture and for the culture and so much the culture do for you. And then Scrunter is to isolate that and see you and immortalize you in song by talking about the woman of the base. Okay. Love story, you know. I now see why Dalton read the damn article. So that love story, you can't, you, you can't make none of this up. How, how much things are to align for that to work? You want to talk about further alignment? Charlo and these fellas when next year come after Scrunter sing this song in 80. <laughs> them fellas and them went to the original composition, if I'm not mistaken, at Despers. So even though Woman on the Bass was about a Despers, Despers bass woman and Despers playing in 1979, Despers did not play it in the following panorama. And you know who played? <laughs> you know who played? Let me, let me, let me get a little taste of it here. I, I can't play the whole thing, right? But I just want you to know who played it. Great all. And I want you to know too, right? That that you're listening to there's woman on the base that is end party and think that's end party for everybody except Stacy Villera. <laughs> the DJ played this in the wedding to end the wedding party, and Stacy make the man start back to play now after he played 13 minutes with a woman on the base. But that was played by All Stars, and that slow version that you're hearing there is a studio recorded version of Woman on the Base. That is not what they play in Panorama. What they play in Panorama and win Panorama with an 80 was much, much faster than that. But just a little history. Eh? Every now and again, this thing is thrown into our classroom. Eh? <laughs> and I, I assure you that when I talk about these things, most of the time it's for my own fascination with some of these stories than, um, than, than really trying to educate everybody. You know, Sometimes when I hear these stories, because I know women on the base all my life, I didn't know that um, it was a real person. But if you didn't know, now you know. 
The ministry, the ministry, the ministry, the ministry of education, all you working in the ministry of education. I find all you working got to be dolly a little too hard here. I'm reading from... This is CNC3. I could read from CNC3. I thought it was a TV station. Ministry orders principals to stop seeking financial contributions with immediate effect. She fed up on the nonsense now. She fed up. All they overdoing it. The Ministry of Education has told schools with immediate effect that they are to desist from asking for contributions from parents during the registration of new students. The Ministry, a statement, ministry issued a statement Friday evening saying principals of government and Government assisted early childhood care and education centers. Primary and secondary schools have been informed that they are to desist from the practice. While there are no registration fees associated with the ECC, the public ECC primary or secondary schools, a practice has developed over many years asking parents to donate or contribute to the school at registration. Though the Ministry of Education is fully cognizant of the fact that pa- parent contributions to school initiatives and projects are helpful. <laughs> Requesting donations or contributions during the registration period has had over time the effect of making what should be a voluntary system seem mandatory. Uh, this perception effectively nullifies the policy of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to offer free education to all students reg- registered at public ECC primary and secondary schools. Uh, the ministry's statement added that due to the anxiety experienced by parents and the annual concern that the national population the annual concern by the national population that this practice has caused principals that this practice has caused principals have advised that these two processes are to be delinked with immediate effect. As such, no school contribution is to be requested of parents at the registration of new school cohorts in government or government assisted and primary schools. Um <laughs> here we're going on then. I don't know if this is when they call it, you know, in PR, they have a technical a placeholder statement. Like, sometimes you, you, you do a release, right? To wait to see what happens. So, so, you take in front. You try to get in front of the issue by issuing a statement. <laughs> it's just a placeholder. In other words, it like, um, a more statement. It don't really mean much. It's, it, it shows that you have responded and you wait to see what the public backlash is after that. You, you probably will get none. It will die off and then you move on, right? <laughs> This statement don't mean anything because, yes, the government promises free education to everybody, but anybody who in the school system or whoever teach children before, fully well know. <laughs> they fully well know that these the, the funding that comes from government is not enough to run the schools. Or more funding could make the thing better, right? <laughs> I remember talking to Father Gregory the other day about the same issue with Fatima. And he basically outright listen. You had to be there's contributions that you had to make to the school because there's a lot more that happens in Fatima that the ministry does not and cannot cover for. I've seen it in Presentation College in San Fernando as well, a school that I always enormously impressed with. The music programs, they have a culinary school. My little brother Salute Stefan who launched a culinary school. So it seems as though Prez is very serious about the roundedness of the boys. You know what I mean? The, 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 none of them can play football down there to save their life, but outside of that, the school is very, very rounded. You, you, find, you tend to find that when, you, when you're talking to press men, you're talking to men who understand and could identify the importance of manhood in a society and act accordingly. I, I have found that to be my experience. That cannot come from government funding only, right? I'm just saying that Maybe what we need to do is to identify and regularize how this funding is requested from parents, particularly in schools where children mightn't be able to afford it, or the parents of children, or in schools like Fatima, where you can't afford the average things that uh, average family in Fatima might be able to just pour three thousand dollars a term as they were paying to Maria Regina and Holy Name Prep and all these different schools and international school that's a primary school and Canadian. What the Canadian people name Maple Leaf, wherever they was paying before. Paying it not going to be an issue for most of the students there, but or the parents there. But for the families that are there and need that assistance, maybe that's a way to figure out how to regularize the system. I think it might be useful. <laughs> now, bear with me here, because I'm not trying to say that a school should just card blast charge people five thousand dollars and make it hard for everybody. Society done hard already. What I'm saying is that additional funding for schools. We shouldn't just shut that down. These schools need funding. 
these little children need to eat, right? <laughs> so we have a school feeding program. I, I, I listened to a podcast. I was doing one of the podcasts for the Conspiracy of Goodness recently with a guest by the name of Debbie Shaw. Check out that episode, right? And she was talking about school funding in the States. And she has a lot of data to back up what she's saying in terms of um, how much meals in the classroom help children and how me- providing meals across the board would help and so on. So I'm saying that if the food, the school feeding program is in effect, right? And in my time, school feeding program used to be lunch. I understand my mother and my father and them used to talk about getting breakfast and lunch in the school feeding and, and milk and mopsy biscuits and all kind of thing. Well, we grew up in a recession, right? We grew up in we grew up in the hard times. Any children who grew up, go to school in the eighties, we only used to get lunch. But I understand now that breakfast has been reintroduced and so on. You know what was one of the things that Debbie Shaw said happened during the pandemic? They realized that they were helping children get better results in schools by providing meals in the classroom, right? And because the pandemic was homeschooling or online school, they figured out a way to get the meals home to the children because it stands to reason that if you need a meal while you're in school in a day, physically, you might not have a meal home if you're home whole day. You know what she realized? When they went home by people now to carry meals, this is in the Yankees place, right? This is in America, the way the FBI and them is. And she would go, they would go deliver the meals at home and then realize it's, it's, it's seven children home. Two don't go to school, two still is in front, you understand know what I mean? So they started providing meals for the household, not just for the children. They provide for all the children in the household, for mommy, everybody eat. And then they saw another increase in the performance of children in schools. So I'm just saying that to say that... While we in a position now with, with, I guess, oil and gas money and whatever we have uh, that, that, that made up the wealth in this society, and the government can provide free schooling or, or non-paid schooling, that's good. But those shut down efforts to raise additional funds. Because while we have breakfast and lunch in, in schools now for the school feeding program, wouldn't it be great if schools can p- provide meals for children who home who might be able to have meals not just the children in the school for their brothers and sisters how sad it is for you to eat and your brother and sister and them hungry wouldn't it be nice for them to provide for the mothers and the fathers home if they're struggling to like like through the school system so it, it, in jamaica they say every mickle make a muckle I, I don't think we should just shut it down i think we should regularize it and let the government support people who may not because I, again People who could afford to pay is a different discussion than people who are struggling to get by or cannot afford to pay or not willing to pay, right? It's a different discussion I have. If it is, the government could identify that there are some schools where 95% of the parents don't have a problem contributing more because it's for the well-being of their children, it's for extracurricular activities, it's so that everybody could come out like pressmen. I don't think you should stop that. What you should address is the 5% who either cannot afford to pay it or refuse to pay it. You, you could work on them differently as well because whether you're... you're let's, just, let's look at the group who refuse to pay it. Refusing to pay a fee for a community that you are a part of that contributes to the betterment of the community and you you uh, get the benefit of... Um, Public and merit goods, right? Go and Google that, right? We have time. I, I don't show it on time already. You, again, public and merit goods. You, you, you're going to you're going to enjoy the benefits of those things. So I could address you if you refuse to pay it, and there's some metric by which I could say you could afford it, right? Which is difficult. And f- or certainly for those who cannot afford to pay it at all, you could make an arrangement with the school saying that okay, if you're collecting money by this, we we're doing it for the betterment of everybody who is qualified or who has who has walked through the doors of the school. I think it's a useful thing. And I'm saying that to say that I went to Fatima a while and then I went to Tranquil. And I saw the difference with the contributions in Tranquil. I was talking about this last week. And a lot of what made Tranquil a real good government school was the involvement of the parents and the students themselves. I remember boys coming in to paint classroom, who paint their own basketball courts. You know what I mean? Things used to happen with the little contributions we get from the community and from the parents and so on. So I feel like if this is something that we need to revisit, I understand why they're stopping it because the public outcry, they're assuming there's just a holding statement. But we should get as much parents as possible to contribute to as much schools as they can, especially the ones that your children are going to. And I think that it's time that we start looking at the business community seriously so that if St. James itself 
St. James have Fatima, Compre, Junior Sec, Mukarapo Girls, Mukarapo Boys, St. Agnes, St. Crispin, and all kind of St. James's, if you want to pull it so far. St. James are a real school, right? The community itself. St. James also have plenty bar, plenty rum shop, plenty electrical place, plenty plumbing place, who's selling food. St. James have a lot of businesses. If we treat the St. James itself like uh, uh, the community that it is, and St. James commu- business community is able to come together to further bolster what the parents contribute into the schools. Then we go start to have a long-term vision for crime that is not about drone and shooting down people. If you have that kind of community approach to schooling where the parents contribute, the government do their part, the business owners and so on come out and do their part, and everybody contributes it for the betterment of the children who passing through that school and thereby, thereby passing through the community of St. James and, and, and going out into the national community. Then you have a long-term crime vision and it's not about drones shooting down people in the streets and the future is the present and the present is the past. So we go, none of them things don't mean nothing <laughs> if we're not doing anything about it at the source. So I feel like if I understand why they put out these statements and so on, but I feel like if we need to explore that, explore how much parents willing to contribute because... They say cheap thing not good, but free thing not good at all. And one of the reasons our education system could be poor is the fact that it's just free and you could just send your child like it's a daycare center and wherever you send them, however they come back home, how they're doing exams they do, and then they go and look for a work or look for a government work. It, 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 we, we in a cycle. We in a, we in a post-colonial cycle with no escape whatsoever. We had to create our own realities now. Every community with schools uh, have have several stakeholders. The government is just one of the stakeholders that the school have. The, the parents must be a part of it. The community must be a part of it. The business community must be a part of it for, for it to succeed. And if you want to separate SME, small and medium businesses from corporation, all of us have to be a part of what the community does. And I want to just take a minute because St. James is the Petri dish for what the nation should run like. So I want to salute to my guy, Karen Moraldo. Man knows BB. Yeah, salute to BB. <laughs> and the whole team at the St. James. I want to tell you, I know the name of the organization, eh? but all you know, I'm not a young man, so I'll Google this so I get right for a change, right? But I saw that the Poor House League is starting back. What would be the Poor House in St. James? What we used to call the um, the infirmary. The home, I, I can't remember what it's called. It. But the... The Poor House League was a football league that used to play back in the St. James Medical Center. I don't know where it's called, you know. All I know is the Poor House and the Infirmary. I can't remember the name of it, no? But the, there's a, a feeling in the back there that we grew up playing football and we watch it. We, we grew up watching Flipper and, and, and these teams play play football right in the back there. Some of, some of the best footballers we'd ever see was playing football in the back there. And I see that the league is regenerated and several teams playing. So I saw an update on it on Facebook recently. I just wanted to highlight that because, again, that is what that is what the community is about. And that those are the initiatives that will change crime. Tr- crime had to be changed as a, a useless, uh, the source as a useless option. It must be something that people not seeing as a big thing to get into. It not worth the risk because there's too much to live for. There's too much opportunity in the country. Too much is being done for me. I love this community too much to rob my fellow man or Molotov cocktail down some house or whatsoever it might be. I, 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 I think that dies where it is. So salute to Karen, Seku, a whole, a whole bunch of youths from any area who reviving that um that poor house league. And if all you need a striker. I, st- I, st- I still have about five good years in me. You know what I mean? At, at the rate of about one goal a year max, right? Uh, the bakeries. I saw the bakeries come out and say that they are not... This is this is from Peter George. Peter George, we've spoken about him many times. Every time he 1% come up, Peter George has come up. And, oh, he's, he's, he's he 1%? This is from Kevon Fellmine. Fellmine? At the Guardian, prices of bread, pastries, and desserts will remain the same at Linda's Bakery despite the country's major flour producers lowering their costs. <laughs> Peter George, the owner of the 63 year old bakery operation, Peter George, the owner of the 63 year old bakery operating in 15 locations in Trinidad. What part of Linda's is 63 years old? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> no, 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 somebody had to help me with this. So, 
Linda's come out after I born. Whole Linda's turned 63. Somebody had helped me with this and always tell me Linda's was around so long. Is it that, that I, I only know Linda's in St. James when it, when I was a little fellow? Because Linda's was not around. What we know is Freddy's and them thing growing up and Pascal's Bakery and Chimook and all. When since Linda's sold anyway? Uh, they said the suppliers NFM did not notify any commercial bakeries about any adjustments in flour prices. Commercial bakeries use large sacks of flour which were not subjected to price uh, adjustments. John said there was no notification to retailers on lowering the cost price of a... He said there was a notification given about lowering the cost price of five, bong, five pound bags. So we should see adjustments at the supermarkets, but not at the bakeries. There's a knock-on effect here, you know, that, that, that really don't matter. What are you saying there? <laughs> Number one, it's likely that that cost saving will be passed on to the commercial or in the, in the, in the business selling channels. They're probably going to adjust the price soon if they didn't do it already after this article written. But also, if the price of flour goes down, you might see people baking more and... It will reduce. It could affect the demand for baked bread by places like Linda's and Kiss, and they go out to adjust the prices downward anyway. So I, I think they, 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 this is a this statement might have been at the time they asked him this, but I don't, I don't see how Linda's and them price wouldn't come down. As I said last week, the only th I think they're waiting on Kiss. They're not gonna move until Kiss move, and they're not gonna come back to the to the public to say anything about. Um, they're not going to come back to the public to say nothing. When NFM tell them, yeah, 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 well, we reduce it here. You will never see the article written. But you'll slowly see the, those prices creeping down. So I hope that that makes for a little bit of an easier time as the general price level starts decreasing. And uh, you know this is something I'm very interested in, so I'll, I'll continue to, to look at it. Before before we jump into sports, right, there's just a few minor things on sports, you know. But I had to take a moment to salute the great Tommy Joseph. We had seen and were hearing some rumors and some talks about Tommy Joseph being sick. And it turns out he had gotten a stroke and wasn't doing so well. As a matter of fact, at one point in time, the news was pretty bleak. It was something like if we will we lose one of the icons and one of the greats, right? But I saw this week an uh, article in The Guardian saying, Tommy Joseph beats stroke of ailments. Looks forward to getting back into carnival and cultural events. Uh... TNT's acclaimed comedian Tommy Joseph has gone 180 degrees since being struck by a series of ailments in 2022 as his family prepared for the worst. Following his doctor's distress calls, Joseph's family gathered at his bedside and he's now recuperating at his San Fernando home, maintaining a healthy diet plan, routine exercise, and abreast of all the current affairs. He's also looking forward to cultural events, notably working with the Kaiso House Calypso Tent, Health issues came up when Joseph had to be hospitalized at the San Fernando General Hospital for fluid retention, consistent with a heart condition. While there, he he was treated for an abscess on his chest and a cerebrovascular accident, or stroke. Why the hell did he just say stroke? To his entire left side. Absorbed by the dilemma, Joseph's wife, Judy Backers Joseph, who spoke in an interview at their home in San Fernando last week, said everything was sudden. She said in 2019, his job became redundant at one 105 FM due to the COVID-19 pandemic, where he was one of the hosts of the Mix Nuts Morning Show alongside George Gonzalez and Natalie Morales. She said her husband's bout of health issues was unforeseen and distressing. Uh, she also said a lot of people did not know that he'd been ailing, but with the intervention of prayers and help and timely medical appointments, his recovery had been consistent. When he, She quoted her saying, when he fell sick, I started to end it in my mind and look at the worst case he was wearing adult diapers he was talking out of his mind as they say talking about things like when you travel you know people say you're traveling it's a miracle somewhere along the line somebody's prayers went up somebody's prayers were answered we have a good neighbors we have good neighbors and well wishers we can't forget people like clive mengo Sherwin, ronda paul vidya shaquille sparks karen shorty etienne who literally carried tommy on his back we were we are we are eternally grateful. So salute, great Tommy Joseph, 69 years old. Good age too, too young for all this. So we're glad to see that he has passed his ailments and seeing better days and better times. I want to leave all you with a couple scrunter, you know. I'm going to play one more before I get into the sports and then play a couple more before I get out. Because scrunter, uh, there, there, there's only so much that we could play. But I see some looking at me in my face here. 
that it would be remiss of me not to play songs like these. Eras and those eras of music from the what is it, late seventies all the way up to today day still releasing hits right and I, I just wanted to as a reminder what I say last week just keep in mind that over the last week episode and this week episode we ain't playing nothing that had nothing to do with Christmas eh? so just respect the catalog right but again salute to Tommy I'm glad to see that that he back one of these days we had to do an episode that's just about comedians in the tents you no know, because you see Tommy. Sprang along, John Agitation, uh, Rachel Price. There are, there are some of them who really make the tent what it is. And again, salute to another podcast that I came across recently. I think I talked about it before. TGIM. Thank God it's Monday. That, that they just do a tent. If, you, if you're into the Calypso, right? And you find I'm not playing enough Calypso. You need to tune into that brother because he is playing about an hour words of Calypso. And he no Kaiso. <laughs> it's a no, he not just picking tune and playing. 
he gave you some history about his song, some background. He, he's very, very knowledgeable as a, as a youth man about Calypso, soca music. I mean, he, it's solid. TGIM, just check out our podcast. Salute to them, man. Um, in terms of in terms of the sports, I'm doing this quick and I'm wrapping up. FPL coming back soon from Fantasy Premier League is almost August and it's time to get back to Fantasy Premier League. Closer to the date, I'm gonna give the codes for all the leagues that we play in so that Oli could be a part of that, right? Salute to Mexico, Oli win the Gold Cup. We had Oli, we let Oli, we let Oli off the hook. Angus, Angus had Oli, but he decided to lower Oli by playing all the youth men and them and make sure that we have our experienced team because Oli could keep that whole Gold Cup. We're looking for World Cup fame at this point in time, right? So, we in that. Uh, I, I was talking about Hart. I don't think I went back to it, but Hart was saying that, um, or the, the, the rumors were saying that Angus is out and with the game back. Either Kevin Calder, Stephen Hart, one of them. But um, Stephen Hart said he knew nothing about this. Asila Sano wrote, Former Soka Warriors head coach Stephen Hart has denied holding any talks with the TTFA regarding the position of men's national senior team head coach. Uh... And a Guardian article had said Hart set for Soka Warriors return. Claimed the Canadian based claim the Canada based coach was the favored choice of local football body by a FIFA run appointed normalization committee had already been approached about, about the position. But there was no suggestion to that the former Soka Warriors forward Kenwin Jones, who captained the team during Hart's tenure turned down a chance at the women's national team to serve as Hart's assistant. So the rumor, and the, the article by The Guardian, I can't even say rumor, was that Angus was out, Hart was getting the job, Kenwin Jones was assistant, but it seems as though none of the story is confirmed. And I think we safe to say at this point, Angus ain't going nowhere because, I mean, Gold Cup come and finish, the winner crowned, we out long time, and there's been no additional word on Angus Eve being maintained or moved as the coach at Trinidad and Tobago. So, I mean, the thing about it is, he had my support because I, I, we didn't look the best in the Gold Cup. But I will say that we've looked better than we've looked in a long time. The problem is that that long time is under Steve Mahat. Because when he was under Steve Mahat, thing was happening. That side was playing. I saw on TTFA Instagram recently some flashbacks from our 2006 campaign. Not 2006, 2010, the South Africa campaign. Uh, for the football enthusiasts, go back and look at the scores in them games or the games themselves. That was a real hard luck campaign. You know? We went up 2-0 to El Salvador in El Salvador and come and draw that game. Give away points. You know? We also give away points against Costa Rica in one of the games in Tobago. I think the first game in that hex was against Costa Rica in Tobago. And we had a penalty with men like Stone John and... Uh, 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 who was on the field? Stern would have been on the field. Lat uh, York was playing still. York was player coach. That might have been under... Is, if it's not Latapi, it's Maturano. Maturano was the coach and Latapi was the assistant coach, if, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I have that right. But we 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 are York then. I think they gave Stern to kick the penalty and Stern missed the penalty and I think we lost that game 3-2 or draw that game 2 all or something like that. That was a real hard luck campaign, but that team was a big team, and people at that that qualifying campaign in particular, people at the opposing teams, the men had real respect Kenwin Jones. They used to they used to have two men up there. They they they're trying to they trying to keep him out of the game when he was on the field and things. So that's a hard luck campaign. But to go from within a decade to where all football went under, what is Gary Griffith partner name again? Um, Elbow Man. To go from Elbow Man. To St. Fleet and all these coaches who just basically, we, we, we I think somewhere in the most must be passing the rush there again too. I mean, we really had to get to the point where all football better than that. And if it, if it means building, of course, it means building local talent, but I think we had to focus on the local talent, uh, lo local coaching talent as well because Lawrence did not the best run. Uh, Angus seemed to be getting something out of the team where at least we looking like we in the we in the ascendancy, or he, he halt the decline, whichever way you want to look at it. But I hope in that whatever the situation with this team settled quickly, because as as again the goal is to we 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 had to be we had to be headed to World Cup, right? Uh, last but not least, Brian Williams. Do you remember Brian Williams of Strike Squad fame, Rasta in the Strike Squad? Former national defender who was a standout with no infamous strike squad of 1989, Brian Williams attempted to break down the issues that led to the failure of the Soka Warriors at the Gold Cup. Following a 3-0 victory against St. Kitts, well, all you know what happened there, right? Uh, 
Williams, who like many, has spent his, his entire life in this sport, tried to explain the formula su- for success in sports and particularly in football. He said, he said it starts with having the right infrastructure and the right administration. He wanted to stay away from the perceived bacchanal of giving comments on that, but it would only continue a reoccurring situation that stagnates progress. He said, I was totally moved by the selection of the team from the St. Kitts and Nevis game and then players' personality Person, the players' personal responsibility is what I looked at. I watched the whole drive by the players, the basic intelligence and the basic understanding to do well and to play hard for the national team, and I did not see that. I am not getting enough of that, and that is an individual responsibility as a player. So, Williams broke down a few things. He, he did get into the administration and so on, but he was basically saying that, or oh, let me quote him here. He quoted as saying, we might bring in Stephen Hart tomorrow and after two, three games, we might be saying it's better we kept Angus. So it might be so because we don't have the divine rights to see these things, but certain infrastructure and sustainability in a properly run league, ensuring that the players are being compensated or paid a decent salary above the minimum wage, and a man could have a hope that he can really give his all to his all. Because to play for, play for international football is a full-time job. So he's basically saying that if the infrastructure and the compensation and those things not in place, uh, the drive from the players not going to be there. The heart and soul, they're putting it all on the line. Like if we're going out there to fight a war. So I, I believe that when people like him make comments like these, we had to take stock of it. And one of the realities, I see Lasana talk about this all the time. One of the realities that is going to keep Trinidad football in limbo is the fact that we still have a normalization committee that is running the football affairs. And we're basically not in charge of our own football affairs, yet FIFA is still basically through the normalization committee managing the day-to-day operations of football in the country. So that could never be good for the development of football. It is always going to lead to a rift between the government here and the foot and the, and the football association businesses as i say nobody's school businesses not going to want to contribute individuals not going to want to contribute the government don't want to contribute and it's, it only leads to the detriment of i want to put myself first as a diehard fan right but the detriment is really to the individual youths who see football as a future i remember on birdie and body podcast uh, mainly at in johnson uh, john or johnson mainly make a statement that she saw the world with her football at her feet. It's such an instructive statement that a young person who see hope in a sport, and uh, uh, not just hope for betterment for themselves, but for the whole family, financial betterment, financial security, for security and financial betterment for their communities, for their country, and the amount of pride that it could bring. If we do have those things, then what it is, how, how will that hunger and desire and drive and fight, where will it come from? So I think salute to Brian Williams for taking a minute to talk about that. And I hope that the powers that be listening. And I, as we talk about listening, let me leave you with two scrunter before we get out of here too, no? This one might not be one of the most popular ones, right? But it's an early scrunter and the vibe of the song is scrunter in essence.
Hey, I want to wish Ole a safe week, you know, safe travels in Ole week. Talking about travels. <laughs> I'll be traveling soon as I'm out. Uh, wait, you're not supposed to tell people you're traveling or anything. Maybe there will be no podcast next week. May or may not. There may or may not be a podcast next week. Uh, according to how this week or weekend go, you will be determine whether our podcast is going to come out next week. But if I don't hear all you, I don't see all you or hear from all you next week. We go catch up the week after whatever news come. I go still take notes and we go be right back on track. So j- just coincidentally, this will go perfect because Joe Budden podcast and his crew going on vacation. And I find like, podcasters should tell people in advance when they're not going and record so everybody could go on vacation at the same time so start to make plans for to it <laughs> and i couldn't do a scrunter episode or two and leave all without the biggest one of them all I'm in the thing in 
take all the time this week, you know, be safe. Take care of all yourself. Them train on vacation. All they put them in a camp while they do them. All they keep them train home. Watch them train and watch them eating all house and land. Hey, I go talk to all you next week. Enjoy all the week.